So this topic here um, is very important to me, uh, being a, a fellow, it's, it's my research area for the fellow, is the Internet of Things. But one of the things that I quickly notice when it comes to the Internet of Things, the consumer takes on a lot of responsibility. And unfortunately, and we were talking about this earlier this morning, that the, a lot of <coughs> consumers do not have the uh, understanding of the Internet of Things or the cybersecurity risk that they're taking on. Then it's a huge responsibility to take on. Because I tell you how I got started with this, my mom wanted a security system at her home. And she, and she just didn't want the uh, system, you know, the audible. She wanted the, the one where she could actually see. And I'm like, my mom, well, she almost said what she needs this for, but I want to keep mom safe. But I was concerned about now I put, I'm introducing this to her home, you know, so I have to make sure I pay close attention to it. So nonetheless, we'll go ahead and we'll get started on educating the Internet of Things users on cybersecurity risk. A little about me, um, I recently retired from the U.S. Navy, spent about 26 years uh, in the U.S. Navy, and didn't even take a break, transitioned over right into the corporate sector, working for Wells Fargo as a cybersecurity professional. And along the way, I do research, I serve as a fellow for the North American Think Tank, and um, I teach for several universities, including the University of Maryland, the University College. And so, that's about me. This topic, again, as you see, I'm very, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And here's some of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, what is IoT, the landscape, the, some of the benefits of it. And we're going to talk about the users. We have to talk about the users in this. The progression, data and IoT, regulations, risk, educating the consumers, and as always, I have to provide recommendations. I hate going to a, giving a presentation and not providing a recommendation. So I always provide those things. So what is IoT? Most of us have IoT in our home and don't even realize it. You know, what's, what's more important to me about it is that is the software and the sensors and networks and electronics and connectivity that we have that we don't particularly manage very well. And so a lot of users have built their own personal IoT and they're not aware of it. And, and today, especially when you know, a good friend of mine just had a house built, and the first thing he started bragging about was the fact that it was a smart home. And when I started talking to him about the risk associated with that, he wasn't very happy. He said he wished the builder would have you know, told him. I said, it's not the builder's responsibility, to be honest with you. You asked for it. So you have to know. <clears throat> and, if you, if you, and I just like using this because, you know, this kind of reminds it looks like inside of our house nowadays. You know, my security system is on my internet, and then I it got sensors of its own, and then I got app, applicants around, uh, uh, appliances around my house that are connected to the device as well. So, I don't know, for my wife and I, we probably got 13, 14 devices connected, just the two of us. And that's probably me being a, a geek. And I just wanted to show you this too. <laughs> Sorry. I wanted to share this with you too because if you can look at it, and, and the Internet of Things is really advancing. And it's advancing at a rate to where a lot of industries are really capitalizing on it and taking an advantage of it. And if you can just look here, I'm sorry this is small, but in the inner circle here, you have like buildings, energy, uh, consumers, um, home, and homes. This is the one I really want to focus on healthcare, industry, transportation, uh, retail, security. And, and the IT and network, and you really see where this is going at the end. It's really going to a small, small cities. A lot of these large metro, uh, metropolitan areas are really interested in Internet of Things because they want to capitalize on it so they can make the city much smarter, to make the city more efficient and more economical to manage. And then I hear we talk about all the devices, you know, locations and devices. So you can just see it, you know, where we are from, a, you know, just a world of connected, you know, services. It's really progressive. And it's progressing at a rate, and we're comfortable with it without really understanding the risk that comes along with that or having policies or regulations in place to help us regulate that. And this is just a snapshot of the internet within 60 seconds. The one thing that I want to point out here, and the reason I, I put this up here is because the internet of things rely on data, it produces data. Because why? Because we want to have optimized decision making. So if you look right here, I always like to pick on Amazon. In 60 seconds, Amazon will make $83,000. I'm just saying. So that's a lot of goods and a lot of activity going on over their network to bring in that type of uh, revenue at $83,000. I mean, Twitter, 20, 278000 We're just talking 60 seconds. So imagine what that looked like. We were able to see the data moving, you know, and throughout the connectivity, throughout the different devices. Imagine what we will see. This is, this is really phenomenal when you put it in perspective and you start talking about how much data. Data is really a huge problem, and we're going to talk about that, why data is a problem. 
Everybody wants data. So this is just, I mean, this, I think this is phenomenal. But what I really would like to see, but I don't think we'll ever get there, is what companies produce within 60 seconds and within an hour in the run of a day. I don't think they will, they will really share that because to me, when you start sharing that, it really shows how reliant you are on that capability and that can lend itself to other problems. And so with the IoT landscape, here's the thing. My, I came in this morning on Uber. I was using my phone because I'm a, I'm a hyper-connected geek. So everybody relies on hyper-connectivity. But what, some things we have to start realizing and understand is that with our own personal network and even with our wearables, I, had, I worked for a manager one time, and she had a diabetic pump on her. And I remember she always used to say, if you see me slumped over on my desk, make sure my pump is on. And I was like, <laughs> and I'm like, how does it work? She was like, it works, but just make sure, you know, you help me monitor my pump because she said on several occasions at night I've been here and security came and caught me. So, um, but just something to think about how when we have our wearables and how we get in our connected cars and, and our homes and we become a larger, we just become one agent in a larger connected world. It's, and it's, it's huge and it doesn't seem like it's going to stop. And we're going to talk about that, but the ones that I really want to focus on is like right here. You know, us when our wearables, our connected cars, our connected homes, you know, how do we defend those, you know, our homes from cybersecurity threats? And, you know, <coughs> up here you see the medical body area where, you know, <coughs> the medical community is just struggling. They've got all kinds of challenges in trying to get their hands wrapped around these wearable devices and these IoT devices. And so let's talk about some of the benefits of IoT. Again, I'm a fan of IoT. You know, it improves our quality of life. It optimizes our decision making, right, because of the data. The data that these devices use, these sensors talking to each other, providing each other with data. You know, some of us have, you know, appliances. For instance, our coffee makers. When we come downstairs in the morning, our coffee is already made. You know, we have appliances where it tells us the condition of the appliance. It tells us, you know, what's in the uh, what's, what's in the refrigerator. We can set our TVs to come on and record at a certain time. You know, I tell a funny story. I, I bought a smart TV and it took me two hours to dumb it down, take all the security features off of it because I didn't want it because the TV was talking to me. <laughs> I didn't want the TV talking to me. You know, um, it generates revenue, automation. And the, one of the most the things that really gets my attention is autonomous. When these devices start talking and acting on their own. Who's responsible? Who's responsible? Who's liable? Me. Anybody remember the den attack? What's that? The den attack, remember that? No. Where um, they had devices who didn't, who had uh, the passwords were the same, people did not change them. And so when they designed this attack, when they you know, was designing the attack for the system, what they did, they said, look for this device. The sensors on these devices, they looked for them, it connected to them, it took control of them, and then those devices just became part of the system. And they, they was able to really impact a lot of uh, businesses in the United States. I remember that, I, was, I happened to have been over the U.S. Cyber Command when that was going on. So you can imagine what we were thinking. Are we seeing our first weaponized attack? That's the first thing we think about. But here's something else you gotta think about. That, that hacker did weaponize up those systems and those devices to do what he wanted to do. So it was essentially a weaponized attack for his advantage because he was able to do it. Communication and uh, cutting edge technologies. A lot of us enjoy the freedom of being able to go on vacation and look back at our house, right? We can pull it up on the phone, we can check out, see who's in the house, we can see if we got any packages. You know, we even got technology now, if somebody comes up to your house, you can get notification that somebody's at your door and you're not even home. And you, and you can engage that individual in a conversation. That's really cutting edge. So, the Pew Research Center tells us that a family of four have 10 connected devices. Like I told you, my wife and I, we have about 13 or 14 devices. We live in a very hyper-connected society. Before we lived in a society where everything was IP-based, we was connected with cables, and we didn't have all the attacks. We had attacks, but we didn't have all the attacks. Anything that's IP-enabled IP is an access point for a potential attack. 
And that's the problem with they're living in a hyper-connected society and we have all these devices connected. Increasing cyber threat. When you start looking at the cyber threat landscape, you got hackers out there who know just as much as we know about these capabilities. And they're doing everything they can to tool and develop resources that, to attack our devices. And so that's why it's important that we hold the manufacturers of our devices important, I mean, to a higher standard, and we hold ourselves to a higher standard to make sure that we're updating our devices when, we, when necessary. We need better security practices. Some people go home, they put the device on the internet, and guess what? They never change the default password. Every hack, yeah. I guarantee you, yeah. every hacker out there knows the default password to every device. Mm -hmm. Various combinations, mobile to mobile, human to human, human to mobile, mobile to human. And most, IL, most IoT systems are unsecure. Unless you're in some type of company or the federal government or the DOD where you secure those systems, it costs a lot of money to secure those systems the way they really need to be secured. So for the most part, I, I, IoT systems are unsecure when they want to transmit, right? Think about that. Most of them just operate in clear. And for the users, humans, most vulnerable in a hyper-connected network. <coughs> Why? We make mistakes. We have poor security practices, and some of us don't understand the cybersecurity around them. We, a lot of us approach it like it's so technical and it's very difficult to understand. But to be honest with you, it's the same thing like how we want, we protect our money in the bank. We put our money in the bank. We can go check on our money in the bank. We manage our money in the bank. We have to take the same approach when we're managing IL, IoT network. You have to learn some things about your IoT network. Is your device vulnerable? You should go home and Google every device you have. You should know every device on your network. And if you see one that you don't think is yours, investigate it. It might not be yours. We need cyber, IoT, data management, and privacy training. And the thing about it, who's doing the training? I mean, yes, we can go out and we can educate ourselves. But some of the training that's coming from that can be provided by the manufacturers are even better. Because they know what attacks they are seeing on their devices. They know the security requirements that they build into these systems. So the more we know and we can get from them, the better off we'll be. I feel like, and I believe the federal government has a role in that too. They can't let the federal government off the system because who's holding the manufacturers accountable for the products that they're developing? No one. I'll be honest with you, at this time, no one. But what we are seeing, we're seeing an uptick in some of these uh, devices. We're seeing them come out with better security uh, protocol built into them. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of devices out there that don't have any security protocols built into them. <coughs> Back in 2015, down in, in Texas, there was a young lady babysitting, and the family had purchased a baby monitor, and they put that in the baby's room. So she was in there working with the baby, trying to get the baby to sleep, and a hacker was talking to her while she was doing it. Because that device, hackers knew that device was vulnerable. And that was one of the first few stories that we were able to catch was that device having such vulnerabilities. Fifty percent of IoT devices manufacturers will not remediate authentication weaknesses. Anybody know why? It costs. It costs, and if they go back and do it, it makes them what? Liable. Mm. So, so what's the life? What's what does that liability fall? Once you purchase that de device, it's yours. You're liable for it now. Only 42% uh, of consumers implement security uh, measures for new gadgets. I put a printer online. The first thing I do is go online <coughs> and I change out the default passwords for everything. The reason I do that is because that printer, printer and fax machines are notorious for being entry points and attack vectors into your network. Notorious. So you have to change those, uh, the default passwords on those devices. Look at this right here. From 2015 to 2025, as you can see, that we're going from basically 60 additional billion devices. But we're not going to stop there. This, this, this chart can go on forever based on the uh, calculations that they're using right now. And so what they're saying we're going to reach, we're going to have seven, 7 billion people, 
with seven trillion things connected to the internet. Everything that's connected to the internet is a source for a cyber attack. People have devices that they haven't touched in months, but they never disconnected it from the internet. If it has power and you never went in and disconnected it from the internet, chances are it's still connected to the internet. And look at the, and, and the growth here is phenomenal. Look at 2020. That's the year, even though here it's got 30, uh, 30 billion, there are researchers that are saying that year we're going to reach 50 billion. I'm like, wow, imagine, look at that growth. That's phenomenal. We have to ask ourselves, why is that growth rate the way it is? And the reason it is because industry is really relying on this as an opportunity to make revenue, to create revenue, and to make a profit. And we, as consumers, we love our gadgets. So everything we buy right now is almost connected. Our automobiles, our homes, all of our devices in our homes. Is there anything we purchase that's not really connected? I mean, our phones. And let's look at it from a personal level at your house. I love talking about this one because if you ask most people what their network at home looks like, they can't draw it out for you. They can't even tell you. They just know that I know what my password is to my Wi-Fi. I know how to identify my Wi-Fi, and I just put it on the Internet. So when we talk about home automation, we're talking about complete home automation. I'm talking about where you got smart keys and keyless entrances into your home. Now, I'm very uncomfortable with that, that having a smart key and smart locks to my house because all I got to do is wait outside and just look for your signature. Once I have your signature, guess what? I can open your house. Smart Bluetooth trackers. <clears throat> Bluetooth, I love Bluetooth. I love being able to ride in my car and hold a conversation. A lot of time I'm in my car working. I call it my second office. But the bad thing about a Bluetooth tracker is that if you look at your data, I always know where you are. Remember the incident that was reported a few weeks, a few months ago, about the troops serving over in the uh, in the, cent in the uh, central command area of operational responsibility. That was eye-opening to me, that we had troops in combat with smart devices that was giving away their location. Not only was it giving their location, it was saying where they were on the base. So you know what the hackers did? They went out and they got overhead imagery of the base, and they started plotting this information, and guess what it was able to do? And this is all open source, open market stuff. It was able to tell where the burdens are. Smart irrigation systems, smart light bulbs, smart TVs, security system, intelligent agents. I want one so bad my wife keeps telling me no. And I don't know why I want one, I just want one. I see the kids playing with it, I hear people asking Alessia questions, I want to do likewise, but my wife said, we don't need one, just Google it. You know, the little baby, you said on Facebook you saw the little baby trying to get the, um, Alexia to play her a song. I mean, it's just, we find ways to use this stuff, but at the same time, we have to really understand the vulnerability that we're bringing into our homes. Our houses are treasure trove of access points. Data collection. We collect, we're producing so much data now and we, we never fathomed this from an industry perspective or from a personal perspective. I mean, we're making Amazon a lot of money just in cloud services alone because a lot of industry uh, partners are leveraging Amazon because of their storage capacity. And you, ask Amazon, you talk to some of the senior leaders from Amazon, they will tell you we're not just a company that provide, you know, goods and merchandise to consumers. We are a technology company. We are a cloud service provider. They are very, very happy with that because they're making a lot of money. Look at how much data we're producing. How much of that actually is used or just thrown away? The uh, data? Yeah. Um, none of it's thrown away, and I'll tell you why. But very little of it is used. You make up a great point. Very little of it is used. But the reason they store this data is because of artificial intelligence coming online. Artificial intelligence, you have to feed it. And for it to optimize decision making, it needs data. So now once you provide that historical data to your current data and your current practices, you have a more, opt uh, more optimized decision. So that's why everybody's interested in saving the data now. But the data that our IoT devices, yes sir? It's also the statute of limitations. You keep it seven years and then you can dispose of it. So yes. there's a requirement to, to 
people leave second years. Yes, but here's the thing though. When you're talking about data, like for instance, Amazon, you, you pay Amazon to be your cloud service provider. Amazon has the responsibility to store your data, protect your data. Guess what Amazon is going to do? They're going to go out and have a subcontractor who's probably going to be overseas somewhere to back their data up. So a lot of companies don't know really where their data is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's true. So think about that. And I mean, U.S. government, same thing. Then it's going to increase the services too, like because if Amazon wants a better company right. to store, then who is going to pay a consumer? Exactly. exactly. The consumer doesn't want to pay because they are there to save money, so they right. say, hey, you know what? Exactly. So th these are things to think about, you know. Who's, all of our data right now, all of us got sensors inside of the house. Where's that data going? Who owns the data? That's going to come up in a few minutes. Okay. Look here, though. I had to look this up. Now, I like numbers, but I had to look this up. 2.5, zeros. That's how much data. There was one researcher that said, he said, by, by 2025, we, have, we would have produced enough data that if you put them on, not CDs, DVDs, it will reach the moon. Wow. wow. Yep. He said, if, around the world, if you were to do that, it would reach, reach the moon because people are collecting that much data. And the need for data drives the IT demand. Companies want to be smart because, I mean, you look at companies like Kodak. Kodak went out of business. Kodak had a strong stance one time, but the iPhone came along, these smartphones came along, and where's Kodak now? Trying to reinvent itself to come back. IoT regulations. This is one of the points I love talking. Any lawyers in the room? Any C lawyers? I know you got to be one. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm showing my colors. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. <laughs> but um, the United States struggle with this one. Yes. We struggle big time with it. I am so happy that the UK got the GDPR out there. Yeah. As you know, it's a start. It's not perfect, but it's a start. California. I know a lot of people talk about the government in California. I like the government in California. Okay. They're taking a stance and they're developing state uh, legislation to do things. Now, you look, if you were to read some of these legislation, uh, legislative policy they, legislative policy they're putting out, they don't really have a whole lot of teeth, but it's a starting point. It's a starting point. And pretty soon, some of the states are going to force the arm of the federal government to get involved. Because right now, the, in the United States, our stance is our government leans more towards big, uh, big companies and corporate uh, side of the house than they do in protecting us. Woefully underprepared. A lot of legal, a lot of um, legal experts, and a lot of lawyers, and a lot of uh, legal researchers don't understand cybersecurity. They don't understand IoT, and not only them, but our congressional leaders as well. When Mark Zuckerberg was in, in they had him on stage up there. Did you all listen to the questions that they were asking? Man, I'd have been turning him up. I mean, I'd have been digging in on him. They were like, "Hey, time out. He needs time out." But he, we let him off. We let him off the hook. And so that showed you right there that our congressional leaders need more understanding of the tech world that we have, that we develop in this country. And so, because they don't understand our regulations, our laws, and our policies trail behind. The Federal Trade Commission, that's one of the leading agencies that's taking a look at IoT. You see what their concerns are, misuse of personal identification, this, um, this meant to say unauthorized access, and the weaponizing of IoT devices. Apple versus the FBI. Who really won that one? Even today, the, the government, has, the federal government, or any Supreme Court, or anybody, has made a ruling on who owns your data. Who, so who really owns our data? We don't really know. The way I look at it, if I'm in possession of it, I own it. But that doesn't mean I get to go out and do what I want to with it, right? And now if you look at the monetizing of data, it adds, it adds on to it, and it complicates the situation even worse. But the Facebook, when we are there at the social media, they said that once you put it up, it's our data, it's not your right. data. So even if I wanted to delete some videos, right. which were two years back, I couldn't delete it. Right. Though, I mean, I deleted for the time being, right. temporary, so that my friends cannot see, but still it was there with the Facebook. Right. You know? So, you're exactly right. Yeah, so, so, 
It's like who owns the data? I lost my data, actually. Right. Who, who knew that every tweet we sent out until a few months ago, the, the federal government made a copy of, has a copy of Every tweet. They just stopped it a few months ago. So that, that shows you we have a huge problem in this country when it comes to, you know, regulations. And that we struggle with that with the IoT side of the house, too, because if my sensor is sending data to a, a server somewhere, one, I might not even know that it's sending the data, and two, I don't have any say over the data. I need help in, in determining what this company can use for my data. Yes, ma'am. But when you receive the data on your phone, right. though you have an Apple phone, okay, you purchase is nice and right. uh, you are secure from consumer point. Right. However, you don't know as a consumer how it was happening out and those devices, right? right. Because those routers, uh, switches, whatever is sitting around, right. we don't know how cheap they bought it yes. and we don't know how secure they are to go through all these IoT uh, regulations. Right. So that's where, actually, I, I'm a student of EMUC, so I just did one at and research paper. Um, they did a very good survey, and that's what we were talking about, about the supply chain, mm -hmm. that supply chain is also responsible <coughs> as user is responsible, and that is where I got all the idea that, wow, I mean, I didn't think of that just getting Apple is not a security I got. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, in between, I lost everything. Yep. Every country is different. Every country is different when it comes to their regulation and how you do data. So, for instance, most companies do not like to do like business in the United States when it comes to like data. And the reason being is because there's certain rules we have that they don't like to deal with. For instance, here's another one. China has put a, a stipulation on countries operating in China. China has a say on what data you can send out of their country. And a lot of other countries over in the Pacific region are they're doing likewise. They're going to a more of a GDPR type policy where they're controlling the data out of the country. But China has isolated its part of the internet, essentially. Yes. Stayed on, right? Stayed on and stay, you know, yeah. you do something we don't like, you don't get on the internet anymore. Even that Isn't have... Europe getting a little more, uh, I guess, conscious and with its rules and regulations on data? I would think that they're getting even more uh, protective of personal data than the United States is. Yes, data. you are. You're, you're exactly right. They are. They're getting very um, strict on how data is being dealt with, because but they don't have all the pushback from all the big corporations that we have over here. We have a lot of pushback, a lot of lobbying for um, for the government not to change the laws when it comes to protecting our personal data. So there's two things we have a, we have a, a, a conflict right now: personal data, I mean data protection, and data privacy. Two total different dichotomies there, right? Two total different arms, but we clash with them all the time. Even I had a client from the uh, Abu Dhabi. Yeah. We couldn't do Skype calls. Yep. Absolutely. So I know I got to get here and pass it, uh, the mic over to Dr. Burrell here, but I rushed you the last few slides, but. Look, if we talk about criticism and controversies, the one that I, I like right here is the lack of transparency. Companies that develop these devices are not giving us true transparency. How do you know about your firmware? How many people knew that these small devices had firmware? Because it's small doesn't mean that it doesn't have some, some, some type of hardware or software in it. So most people are not even tracking that before. And just talk about some of our technological challenges. Technological standardization, I think that will help us out tremendously if we can work with manufacturers to standardize the way they go, they'll go about dealing with their firmware and their security control procedures. It will help us out as consumers when we know how to interact with that device, we know how to update it, we know how to maintain it, we know to where to go and get the software patches for it to overcome the vulnerabilities. Because one thing about it is the cybersecurity landscape is dynamic, it's changing constantly. So some of our challenges with this is that we're constantly dealing with an insecure network. That's an insecure, that's you, unsecure. I'm sorry. Uh, unsecure software firm, I mean a software uh, firmware. Lack of government oversight and lack of government sponsored IoT education training programs. That's, that's, that's really needed. Our cybersecurity risks. These are just some of them when it comes to, to IoT. And these are basic ones. These are not even the advanced ones when, we look, when we're looking at this. If your operator system is not updated, automatically know that you, are, you have a vulnerability. 
when you have weak credentials, if your password is your name, consider yourself God. Because they can use uh, brute force to, get, to determine your password in seconds. So that's why they ask you to make your passwords longer. The longer it is, the longer it takes for them to mine are like 16 characters. By the time they get tired of figuring it out, I change it to something else. Um, coding and the buffering, that's another, that's a software, that's a software issue. We have to start looking at software development of our uh, firmware and physical theft and tampering. When people come into your house, whether do not just give them automatic access to your network. The one thing that I do, I give them a laptop that's already connected on my network. And it's probably just gonna be a Linux laptop. And it's gonna have it's gonna have one one application on it and it's gonna be Firefox. Because I, when you put when you give people access to your network, you don't know what they're doing. So protect your network. Educating consumers. Product safety legislation is not security assurance or security legislation. Product safety deals with the harm of the product impacting you, not protecting you from cybersecurity vulnerability and threats. Hyper-connected IoT systems, it's very difficult to maintain that security of that system. Yes, sir. Um, in your travels, have you seen any numbers of what's the value of data collected by organizations like banks that you cannot opt out and they, can, they say that they, they will share your personal information with associates, unknown to organizations, and so on. I'm thinking that there's a, there's a cash flow stream from the sale of data that could be almost equal to what the banks make between profit margin. I will tell you this. Yes. Banks cannot sell your data. What's that? Banks cannot sell your data. However, banks can have third party partners that will sell you data. Well, that's, there's this, this uh, cover what they tell you, if you go through the list of opting out, you don't have the opportunity to opt out. You can, and they say, through third parties and, and associates, they don't define who they are. Right. And, and I don't think you even get the, again, if you wrote them a letter, you wouldn't be able to find out who has your data. Right. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you've seen any CAO studies or anything about the value of that. That uh, that resale for, for marketing. No, I have. Well, that's that's a good question. Good question. I'll take that on now. Thank you. And just basic stuff like SSL. That's that's like authentication right there. Yes. Basic stuff. Yes. Devices and right. We need to know that your devices are constantly reacting. When you're not home, they're reacting. When you leave and your garage door closes, there's a log somewhere on that system that that garage door closed. Your coffee's being made, the temperature of the water in the house, all these logs are created and generated for data points. They're going somewhere. So guess what? If I was a hacker and I can get in your system and I can get those logs, I can put together your pattern of life. So I know when I'm breaking in your house. Just saying. I, I'm a good guy. Yeah, more outbreaks <laughs> now occur in the afternoon right. than at night. Right, because people, I mean, when it comes to security, people are giving indicators that they're not there, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, for me, when I, when I travel, sometimes when I leave at night, you know, my wife comes to the door, I, I get upset with her. Why did you come to the door? Now I didn't know you there. If you didn't come to the door, they wouldn't know who was in the house. So I would try to get, to get her to be security conscious about things. She was like, you know, you're killing me with the security. I'm like, I don't know. That's what I did. So uh, we need to understand our network topology. We need to be able to understand the, our layout of our, of our network. You, don't be afraid of it. It's very simple. I mean, you can learn it on Google. To know what your network looks like. Just also understand that through cloud, the more cloud access points you touch, your security breaks down over time. If you want security in the cloud, you know how you have to get it? Pay for it. Everything you want in the cloud, you can get it, but it's going to cost you. They, um, leverage communities of practice. I believe like if we can start communities of practice, with industry and with the government is a way to help educate us as consumers on, on the, um, the risks associated with our IoT devices and networks. And I, I don't believe that the federal government is going to come out and just offer this until we start demanding this as consumers and that they start holding the manufacturers of these devices accountable. Okay. Just like they do medicine, right? We need to ask for the same. And this is just a list of our IoT uh, security recommendations. My next slide is um, just a question and slide. 
I'm sorry I had to rush to the end, but I want to make sure I give a Dr. Rell opportunity to present his presentation as well. So, any questions on this right here? I have a comment, if anything. Yes. When I was a senior in high school, they offered as an elective an internet use class where they taught us the history of the internet, how to use different search engines and things like that. So I'm imagining an IoT class for high school students would be one of the ways to introduce them to these risks and how to protect themselves. Yes. Or how to be better hackers. You're <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I mean, whatever you want to learn when it comes to cybersecurity, you can find it on the internet. I mean, I've learned how to do Linux. I've never took a Linux class. I learned how to do Linux from the internet. And so that's why I say when people come over my house, they want to buy, they want to get on my network. Hey man, this machine already connected. Yeah, I don't know what you want to do on my network, so I just want to make sure of that. So, but you're right. We do need to start educating our kids not only in high school earlier than that. Yeah. These kids at four years old, a child is a, the level of a genius. We have to capture that and leverage that intelligence that they have to teach them anything we want them to know, including tech. So cybersecurity is one of them. Whether it's programming, coding, IT, network management, we can start teaching them at that young age and expose them to it. Yes, sir. It's just another comment, um, not so much about the kids and everything else. It's something I watch, um, especially through this company um, I visited. Um, they're actually producing uh, machines to basically clean your area. Um, and you can control it through your Android device or your phone. Um, the cybersecurity aspect of that is that it's mapping out the layout of your home. It also reports back to the mothership, I call it, um, exactly your patterns so, um, and everything else. So that information is readily available on the internet. As an ethical hacker, um, you can basically find out a person. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But, you can easily get into that. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything you want to like to say, anything you want to learn, is it, on the internet. And this problem right here is going to take us keep addressing this problem, and us talking about uh, IoT legislation and policies, and holding the manufacturers accountable for this. I don't care. Until then, do I need to carry it? this is going to exist just like this. Okay. It's going to leave us yeah, the most vulnerable, and we're going to have to deal with the broader situation. Yeah. And I don't think consumers should be taking this all by themselves. <coughs> It needs to be a shared work, a shared load across the board, including working with um, the, the government taking the lead on it. It's just a comment while she's making the change. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, I had uh, gone to a doctor's office who told me, oh, we're putting our stuff in the cloud and we are uh, tracking information. So about when I had my three-month appointment, I went back. I called back to verify the appointment. They didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. So basically, someone had gone in, wiped 25,000 of their records. They didn't have a clue. Not only did they not know who the customers were, they didn't even know who owned them. Well, so I, I, I tell you about the cloud real quick. If you, own, you have a, a service for the cloud, you need to make sure what service you got. You need to practice your uh, what we call your emergency procedure, like basically restoring your network. Because if you if you let them off the hook, you just a number to them. You need to make sure your data is there. And when you want to recall that data, they should be able to recall that data. They should be able to tell you the last time it was updated. And they should be able to tell you where it's maintained and how it's maintained. If they can't, you need to cancel your contract to find somebody else. But that's that's very common in cloud. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, my colleague, Dr. Nobles, uh, he and I have been working a lot around a lot of aspects of cybersecurity. And so, you know, one of the fascinating things that we constantly talk about is just how things are evolving in terms of how we address these issues in context. And one of the big things that me and Dr. Nobles have talked about is kind of the shortage of cybersecurity people that are out there and what organizations are doing to try to leverage it. And so one of the areas that we've had a lot of discussions about is a lot of them are utilizing virtual teams. He is, um, and, and Dr. Nobles will tell you, he works with a team of cybersecurity professionals and he lives in Maryland and no, the, his colleagues he worked with live all over the country, some even live outside of the country. And so one of the things that I try to, we try to engage people in discussions about is, you know, there's some principles and things that you really have to have in place in order for those teams to be effective. 
because there's some different dynamics when people are remote than what they would be if people are face to face. And so we did a little research and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those dynamics. And so, you know, we understand the term team, it's a collection of individuals. A lot of times they're engaged in individual tasks. They need to manage relationships across organizational boundaries. And so when you start to speak about cybersecurity, because the stakes are so high with your ability to steal people's data, ability to steal people's payment information, et cetera, it's really important that these people work collaboratively together as a team. Um, and there's some things that are really uh, driving this whole conversation. You know, we've got globalizations, uh, we've got a variety of attacks that are happening, um, organizations are trying to manage risk, and so one of the challenges is a shortage of people with expertise. They're trying to find ways to, number one, manage these risks, but also develop teams that are um, have the ability to manage these risks collaboratively. So one of the conversations in a lot of organizations about cybersecurity and cybersecurity teams is, you know, in our traditional workplace, we might work nine to five. When the door is shut, everyone goes home. But when you start talking about cybersecurity now, you need teams that work 24 hours, seven days a week. And you also need the ability to leverage teams that may not be in one location. You know, one of the challenges and one of the reasons why you need virtual teams when it comes to cyber is, what if someone hits our headquarters, now how do we function, right? So for business continuity purposes, a lot of organizations are trying to spread their individuals out. So if you hit the headquarters or you hit the main server or something happens at one location, you still have the ability to function, you still have the ability to conduct business. <clears throat> um, so I talk about this whole aspect of virtual teams and you know, what virtualization has allowed us to do. So, you know, years ago, we didn't have unique things like Zoom and Skype and GoToMeeting and Adobe Connect. You know, the back in the day, it was a conference call. <laughs> and so everyone's in there and they're, they're all crowded around this one phone and we're all having a conversation. But now with technology like Zoom, you know, Dr. Nobles and I talk about it. We work for a university where you know, our colleagues are all around the country and then you look in that Zoom and there's one big one and then all our pictures are up there. And we're all able to talk, we're all able to gauge each other. Or if you look at the evolution of teaching and learning online, a lot of these technologies have allowed people to collaborate in ways that even 15 years ago were not viable or options. So virtual team is people are geographically spread around. So one of the things is um, that it could be people working from different regions different areas of the country, or even different buildings. And so one of the things with teams characteristics that either um, are challenges with teams or you have to consider when you're managing is, you know, goal clarity. Uh, what is the goals of the team? What are we here to do? And so a lot of times organizations say, okay, we put these cybersecurity professionals together and our real goal is we need to protect the organization. But they don't think about it a little bit further than that. One of the things in terms of my research that's really an issue out there is we're hiring these people because they're great computer scientists or we're hiring these people because they're great cybersecurity specialists. And then when they get promoted to management, now the, 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 the things that might have made them great in that realm, they need a new set of skills. We have to manage people or manage teams. And a lot of times organizations are not intentionally putting mechanisms in place in order to address that. And so these are some of the areas you really have to understand. Role clarity, um, team efficacy. Um, and, and the things when you're, when you're managing these teams, you have to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the people that work on your team. And so a lot of times, one of the issues that starts to take place is we're looking at people on paper, they have these certain skills, but we're not going to the next level to see, okay, how are we mixing and matching the people on the team? Is everyone on the team have the same skill sets? Are we looking to leverage people with different abilities and skills? just being thoughtful in terms of how those teams are constructed and the type of expertise and people that you're including on that team. Um, there's some things about team player style, contributor, collaborator, communicator, challenger. So one of the things that's real important is, you know, building that cohesiveness in the team where people with differences can have constructive conversations. If anyone goes back and thinks about the challenger accident, one of the problems with the whole accident was this whole group think thing, where everybody was kind of thinking the same way and people didn't really have an environment to challenge status quo or people didn't have an environment to look at a diversity of thought. 
I worked eight years at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and a lot of my work there is I used to do managerial skills, leadership skills with technical professionals. And one of the things that we realize is in order to have a real safety culture in an organization because we regulate nuclear power, we needed to change some dynamics in the workplace. Because when you're mission driven, a lot of pressure is let's get the job done. And a lot of times that pressure to get the job done and meet deadlines often squashes that one dissenter that might see something that someone else doesn't see. And so one of the things that we started to develop, and this is real important when you start to think about cybersecurity and protection, is we created this open door policy in our organization. And what the open door policy did is it allowed a technical specialist or an engineer to say, everyone on my team thinks this, but I think this. And it gave them an audience with a managerial level to really have a discussion, engage, and state their case as to why. And that person had the ability to bring that up certain channels. And one of the nuances about that culture was um, there was no retaliation against that person. So, you know, a lot of times in an organization, you have that one dissenter, they dissent, and now they're ostracized, or now they're outside the team, or now people have animosity because this person slowed up this process and we're trying to meet this deadline. The other thing is understanding team size and what's effective. So, one of the things that's a challenge sometimes is what if the team is too big? You know, one time <laughs> Calvin and I were talking about some focus group research and we had focus groups with 50 people. <laughs> and the problem with those focus groups was how could we get good data we could use? And one of the things I recognized and realized, instead of having a focus group of 50 people, maybe it's better to have five groups of 10. And so when you start to look effectively, when you have groups that large or groups that are engaged in trying to, to do a series of tasks, you're not really able to leverage the collective intelligence of the group because the size of the team is, is, is improper. So there's a Bell Lab study, and one of the things they talk about, so when you start to talk about teams, especially virtual teams, one of the big issues is communication and how we engage each other. And so the Bell Lab study said, Team members on the same corridor are five times more likely to collaborate than team members on the same floor in separate corridors. So basically, socially, in a lot of ways, we're kind of lazy, right? <laughs> if you're right there and I can just walk across a cubicle, it's a lot easier for me or less labor intensive for me to do that than if you're in a, down the hall or around the corner. And so they talked about it. So team members on a separate floor are even less likely to collaborate. So what does this study really tell us about virtual teams? You've got to intentionally create dynamics for them to communicate. And as a manager of that virtual team, you've got to kind of force the envelope around it because it really doesn't happen organically. So communication and distance is a part of that. Next door, likely to communicate weekly. Same aisle, rare to communicate weekly. Different floor across the road, slim chance. The dynamic I always give to help people understand this is that colleague that you work with, that you're really good friends with, but you're busy doing your work and they're busy doing their work, and then you run across each other in the hallway and you're like, oh my God, this is my friend Calvin. I should make more of an effort to engage Calvin, but we're in our own world and we don't. And so part of the challenge when we're doing our work is for team managers that are dealing with remote teams to really encourage that collaborative communication as a group. So key challenge in terms of groups, um, virtual groups is developing trust. So if I don't know you or if I've never met you personally, it's gonna be difficult for me to develop trust beyond here's my duty to get this job done, so therefore I'm gonna do it. And so one of the fascinating things that we had to do for technical people at our agency was even though members on the team were remote, to start to build a relationships on the team, we did a team building exercise where they all made face to face before they commenced the project. And so one of the things we did as an exercise was an escape room. Um, if anyone knows what escape rooms are is when you put people in an environment and they have to work together and collaborate and figure out the way to get out of the room. And so close by here is Vent Hill where they have an escape room, they have a series of escape rooms, and one of the ones they have is like the Russian Bay of Pigs conflict. And so they put you in a room and you have an hour, and you've got to find clues in the room, 
And as you find each clue, you find the key, you need 10 keys to open the door. And so one of the things they talk about in that escape room exercise is majority of people don't get out in the hour that you're allotted and able to get out. And so one of the things with the exercise you're able to do is the stakes are not as high as the workplace. It's more fun, it's more casual, but it, what it allows you to do is engage each other in a fun exercise where I get to know various strengths of my colleagues. And one of the things that we found is previously when we put teams together versus the teams we ran through the team building exercise, we found that they worked more collaboratively together because they had that face-to-face -face exercise where they got to know each other, they laughed, but they also got to value each other's opinion and respect each other's intelligence. And as an end result, they bonded a lot better as a group. So anything you can do as a manager to try to create that cohesiveness when the team starts, I think is a critical aspect of you developing an effective remote team. So one of the things that's real important is ground rules in terms of how the team conducts itself and engages each other. So you can't just say, here's a project, let's go do it. You know, a lot of research out there says that we set these ground rules up front. And what's interesting about the ground rules is there's even more buy-in if you let the team create their own ground rules. So how are we going to engage each other? How, are we, how often are we going to communicate? You know, what are the ways that we deal with conflict? Where they create their own ground rules and they buy in, and then from there, those are the bylaws that the team kind of follows in terms of their engagement. Oh, and so the other thing is, obviously we all use email, but you know, a lot of the research talks about using things where you can see people, facial expressions, body language, smile, et cetera. And again, with things like Zoom and GoToMeeting now, we have that technology now, and it's a lot more cost effective than even what it was five years ago. So, you know, you might occasionally do things where we communicate through email, but anything you can do where people can kind of see each other face to face and engage each other, you know, tends to be a lot more effective. Um, I'm trying to get to the end. So some of the things that, again, impact ability for a virtual team to work together. Lack of social introduction. So if you don't have that one event where we meet each other, we just show up, we don't know each other, I don't know each other's backgrounds, I don't know each other's credentials, that can, that can inhibit the team. Lack of enthusiasm. You know, one of the things that is critical in all the research out there that says, you know, it's not just saying we gotta get this work done, but I think for anyone that's managing this virtual remote team or as a team leader or project manager, it's really helping people see how important the work they're doing is to the overall organization. You know, explaining to them how significant it is kind of builds that enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Um, unequally disputed, uh, distributed communication. So one of the things that's a uh, uh, challenge sometimes is if I just say, oh, you're the note taker or you're this or you're that, and we don't have an opportunity to distribute the duties, and you have one person who's coordinating the meeting, taking the notes, doing a variety of other things, that can create um, some issues or animosity. Um, shallow ideas. So one of the things is you've got to create the right environment where we're not having superficial discussions. Especially when you start to think about important things like cybersecurity, you've got to create an environment where people can challenge each other. I talk to Dr. Nobles all the time, and there's things where he says, I'm about to go in this meeting, and I think it's going to be a, a struggle. And the reason why he says it's going to be a struggle is because he knows it's not going to be a superficial conversation because the expertise and perspective he's bringing to the table is very, very important to protecting the company from a cybersecurity standpoint. Lack of task focus. It's real important that you can really focus the team. How many times have you been on those meetings where the meeting could be 15 minutes, but it's two hours because we're not really focused on what we're trying to do. So really kind of creating a task focus. Okay, here's the meeting today, here's the agenda, here's the things that we need to get through, setting those things up front. Um, lack of individual initiative. This is all about understanding individuals on the team and understanding their role on the team. So a lot of times I try to explain this to people why when you think about if you were an undergrad in grad school, and for me as a professor, one of the things I find out out there is most people hate to work in groups. 
<laughs> and the reason why they hate to work in groups is when I talk about lack of individual initiative, everyone knows there's a slacker. Everyone knows there's a type A person that wants to dominate the team, right? <laughs> and the challenge with the slacker is you have to do the presentation. They didn't turn in all their work on time, but the night you're supposed to present, they show up five minutes before and they ask everyone what they're doing. So part of the challenge is really holding each other accountable for how we you know, work as a team, but really understanding that each individual has to have their own level of initiative in order to be effective. You know, one of the things I try to explain to people is, if you're not tapping into collective intelligence of everybody, in theory, anyone that likes sports, it's like you're playing basketball with the Lakers and LeBron has five people and you only have two. So what are the chances you're gonna win if you're not playing five on five? Probably unlikely. So really getting people engaged and helping people understand or develop their individual initiative is important. And one of the things is critical is feedback. So Marcus Buckingham is an author out there that talks about strength-based development. And one of the things that he says that's broken in our professional workplace is organizations don't know how to leverage individual strengths. And one of the things he talks about is managers don't have discussions with you about what your strengths are. He says the performance evaluation is useless. He said because in your hour performance evaluation, it looks backwards, not forward. And really, you might be doing 90% of the job, but 55 minutes of that performance evaluation is going to be what they need you to do in the next year. <laughs> and it's going to be five minutes on what you do very, very well. And so one of the things he talks about, which is better than having an annual performance evaluation, is if you're getting feedback on your work periodically. So when you're having your one-on-one -on -one with the boss, he talks about it monthly, bi-weekly, if you're getting feedback. Hey, you're doing this well, you need to leverage this, whatever. It's, it's gonna move the needle more in performance than the only time your boss talks to you about performance is, okay, annually, once a year, <laughs> and that's essentially it. And so when you start talking about effective teams, especially something like cybersecurity, where you're dealing with just-in-time events, Feedback is critical. Feedback about performance is critical. It's always a thing where you have to engage in kind of calibration or a temperature check as you move forward.